bonus episode of Decoding Fox News, and I'm your host, Juliet Jeske. What is this bonus episode all about? Well, this is Super Tuesday. Now, I know Super Tuesday at this point was almost a week ago, but no one, and I can promise you this because no one is as crazy as I am, is going to break down. Drum roll, please. I don't have a drum roll. This is a low-budget production, but drum roll, please. Nine hours of Fox News coverage from Super Tuesday. That's right. I didn't realize it was going to be nine hours when I started this journey, but I just kept going. They're, they're still going. They're still going. They're still going. So I was capturing it in three-hour clips, and I was like, this is this is madness. But then I really actually started to enjoy it because uh, the guests at the end are so worth the wait. I made this into a Twitter thread. I think it was overwhelming for people, and it didn't perform as well as I wanted it to. So it made me even more motivated to make the podcast because these clips are golden. And what I'm going to be basically doing tomorrow probably is isolating some of these clips and making them into individual tweets because I think people really need to see these um, besides just my decoding Fox News audience. I'm telling you the last like two, three hours got really fun on Fox News because they <laughs> there was no uh, it wasn't the usual guests because I think nobody else wanted to do that time slot. Um, and this was some of these people were um, East Coast, so they were up at 3 a.m. So it was but tr- trust me, it's worth it. This might also be I'm going to give everybody a warning very quickly, a longer than usual episode because I have nine hours to go over. I broke it down to nine t- t- clips, none of which are more than uh, two minutes, 20 seconds, because that's the Twitter breakdown. So I should give out a really quick shout out to my sponsor before we start, because I don't want to interrupt this. Who is that sponsor, you may ask? It's not a rich billionaire like a lot of the right wingers have. It's not some sort of corporation trying to uh, use me to manipulate the public. Heck no. No. It's I have no large donors. I have no large sponsors. I have no advertisers. This project is 100% paid for by subscribers to my Substack and paid supporters on my Patreon. You can find my Substack at Decoding Fox News at Substack.com. Uh, you can also find my Patreon for Decoding Fox News. And if you can't afford to become a paid subscriber or a paid supporter, share the podcast with your friends, share the newsletter that helps generate the audience, pump it up, that sort of thing. Give me a good review. That is always very helpful. I also have, I forgot to mention at the last podcast, an Amazon wish list, which at this point really only has cat food on it and snacks. But <laughs> I always appreciate it because I don't, this is not a lucrative job. I know, shocking that a media project that has hundreds of subscribers is not, I'm not making the money that somebody at Daily Mail is making, but that's okay. I do this because I love this work and um, I am, I will say, energized by the community that is decoding Fox News every time. I do this for you guys. I do this for my people. Here we go. We're going to go down a crazy journey of nine hours. So I had no idea what I was getting myself into on Tuesday night, but once I realized Fox aired nine hours of coverage, I took it as a personal challenge to go over all of it. The network went all in. Fox had correspondents reporting from all over the country, including the southern border. The network also included as many as six Fox news hosts and experts in discussion panels. It was epic. A lot of the Fox News hosts praised Donald J. Trump at length, while they toned down their vitriol and criticism of Nikki Haley. They're sort of trying to come in for that landing now. Nikki Haley is no longer the enemy because they want her voters. They want her supporters. So when they weren't praising Trump or tearing down President Joe Biden, the producers also weaved in segments about the southern border, including the murder of Lake and Riley. Fox also included segments about the recent Supreme Court decision to reject any state ballot challenges to Trump's campaign, along with his other criminal and court cases. So they were just kind of, they would just slip these in. They just have these segments that were totally not about the primary, and then they go back to the primary. So I've compiled examples of the moments when Fox News personalities slipped up a bit and showed some of the weaknesses in Trump's campaign. So here we go. Uh, Hour one started at 7 p.m., they called it Democracy 2024 Super Tuesday. Anchors were Brett Baer, Martha McCallum, the two legit kind of main anchors over at Fox News. The featured host for this hour was Laura Ingram. The correspondents were Bill Hemmer 
and he was he had the election map. Ashi Hasni, she was at Mar-a-Lago. Bill Malusian, he was in South Carolina at Nikki Haley's headquarters. Mark Meredith, he was in North Carolina. They just sent him to North Carolina to cover the governor's race. And then they had Alexis McAdams in New York City. She's our favorite because she screwed up that Niagara Falls story. At, for the panel, so that's already, they got a lot of correspondence. For the panel, they had Britt Hume, Laura Ingram, Dana Perino, and Harold Ford Jr. They also had a separate legal panel. I'm not kidding. It gets this crazy. Shannon Bream, and she had Andy McCarthy and Jonathan Turley, who are both regulars on Fox as legal analysts. So it starts off with, surprisingly, the booze report from Mar-a-Lago. There is no open bar, and uh, there is a uh, soda bar, a pop bar, if you want to call it, if you're from the Midwest, uh, but we, no, no free alcohol, at least tonight here in Mar-a-Lago. I don't know why that was relevant, but it becomes funny because she does a follow-up on that. That was Aisha Hasni. Um, we, I, she does not appear a lot on my the shows I cover, but she's, again, considered more of a legit journalist. Now, we're moving on to Laura Ingram, who has been trashing Nikki Haley the whole time. Suddenly, her tone has changed. And she's attractive. She's articulate. She's very smart. She's tried to go at Trump. Um, and I don't know how you could have done it any better than she did it. So again, as a recap, Laura Ingram was ripping on Nikki Haley as soon as she announced her campaign for, for president. She ripped on her it, like the next day, and she continued to rip on her. So now that she's definitely out of the race, or she wasn't officially yet, but it was pretty obvious she would be, now suddenly she's like, she's amazing. Well, she was amazing. Nikki Haley. <laughs> That's my bad Laura Ingram impression. Moving on. Last night that he wanted to reach out to Democrat mayors. He said work we have to them. fix the cities right? and he wants to work with them. Um, that's going to be interesting to watch. He wants to well. do a, a rally here in New York. Hey, Bill, do you know if there's an open bar there? <laughs> <laughs> that was Martha McCallum and Brett Baer, and they're talking to Bill Malusian, who's at Nikki Haley headquarters in South Carolina. And what was crazy about this is they had the woman in Mar-a-Lago. She's like in the party talking about the bar. And pretty much everybody else was standing somewhere in a, in a, in a completely bare sidewalk with like nothing behind them just like the darkness and a camera and a light on them and that was it i was like ooh, bleak bleak <laughs> no open bar but we got a nice uh, pier behind us and some boats and some fishing no. so the next voice you're going to hear is mark meredith he was in north carolina and again he's just sort of randomly outside in north carolina in raleigh they never really say where he was talking about how mark robinson who's a person who's made a lot of extremist horrific anti-semitic comments just won the GOP nomination in the primary. Republicans going in tonight were looking likely to back Mark Robinson, the state's lieutenant governor. Trump endorsed him over the weekend, even calling him at one point Martin Luther King on steroids. So just to clarify, Mark Robinson's running for governor of North Carolina. And, you know, they, they're acting very excited about him, but he's kind of a liability because his, his views are so extreme. And there was a clip that just got released where he said women shouldn't vote or he was happy when women couldn't vote. He's got problems, problems, problems. Next up is Alexis McAdams, who's one of our favorites because, again, she completely screwed up the Niagara Falls non-terrorist attack that she called a terrorist attack. It was just a horrible car accident. Here she's discussing migrant crime. Brett, well, when you're out on the campaign trail, as you know, you talk to people and they speak about everything from violent crime to migrant crime. It's incidents like this on your screen that have people all across the country on edge, from smash and grab robberies in Virginia to brutal beatdowns out in California. These crimes that you're looking at there on the screen, you can see the guy waving a gun and the beat down there in the corner. Those are just in the 16 Super Tuesday states. Although the FBI says crime in almost every single category has gone down across the country in 2023. What do those stats really mean to people who have been victims? Not much, right? Definitely some uh, manipulative language there used by Mick Adams. Now, what she's talking about when she keeps referring to the screen, what you see on the screen there, is Fox had taken, she was, she was just a voice. She was a disembodied voice. And Fox took the screen, cut it up into four quadrants, and had video of crime, like a surveillance video of crimes in four different cities that were obviously, it wasn't live. These aren't like live crimes she's reporting on. This is recorded crimes. And she's just showing like four crimes all at the same time. Like, look at this, look at this, run, run, run. And then she says migrant crime as if it's a separate type of crime than just crime. There's financial crime, 
There's violent crime. There's property crime. Basically, there's other types of crime. Domestic violence, but, you know, stuff like that. I get domestic violence would be considered violent crime, but it's sort of a subsection. But that's pretty much crime. There's no such thing as migrant crime. It's just something Donald J. Trump came up with to scare people. Right. And this election, migrant crime is sitting in the national spotlight here. You can check out these mug shots with recent cases of migrants accused of committing violent crimes, including the tragic case of Lake and Riley, which we've been talking about. The 22 year old nursing student was murdered while out on run in Georgia. So pretty much for this whole segment, uh, Mick Adams wasn't even on the screen. This was an image what she's talking about, like, see, there's mug shots is the entire screen just says migrant crime really big at the top crime in red in a like a red box. And then there's three mug shots of three men who were recently one of them being the man who allegedly murdered Lake and Riley have to say allegedly because he hasn't had a trial yet. And they show these three men on the screen and it's just like scary, scary, scary with again, migrant crime really big on the top. Next is Laura Ingram just saying something that's funny. And here we go. Number of, uh, um, just one thing, the, yeah, yeah. the emergency fund that people have, yeah. like regular people have emergency funds, they don't have an emergency fund. It's like 50% of the country can't afford a $1,000 unexpected bill. Check yep. That's check. terrifying to live that way. I just found her use of the term regular people to be kind of funny, like regular people. Regular people, not like us. We all make millions of dollars, but regular people, they don't have an emergency fund. Like, okay, Laura Ingram, you don't come across as condescending at all. Now, next up, we have hour two and the basically the same setup. The featured host was Jesse Water, same correspondence, new panel. We have Jessica Tarloff, Larry uh, Kudlow, Kellyanne Conway, Trey Gowdy, and Carl Rove. Bill Hemmer's at the board. You're looking at Vermont. You yep. say that it's interesting I mean, it's, in Vermont. I, I mean, what, about a week and a half ago, you said we're going to have any drama tonight. Right. And I said, we're going to find the drama. So the obvious drama was, of course, that Nikki Haley was going to win Vermont. Now we move on to Jesse Waters saying a number of stupid things. Britt Hume gave me some advice. He said, Jesse, don't make any more predictions. <laughs> so I won't be making any more predictions ever. Waters famously predicted a great red wave in the midterms and that Michelle Obama would run for president. And he was wrong on both. Moving on to Jessica Tarloff. I'm concerned about Nikki Haley's voters. So you look at the exits for GOP voters tonight who won't guarantee their vote for the nominee. North Carolina, 35 percent. Virginia, 36 percent. California, 33 percent. That has been consistent, that there's 30 to 50 percent of people who don't want Donald Trump but identify as a Republican or are voting in that primary. So, of course, Jessica Tarloff is doing her job. She's getting at the point that, yeah, these Nikki Haley voters might become a problem for Trump. Moving on back to Jesse Waters, and you're going to hear Trey Gowdy after him. You, you go into someone at that age's house and you try to adjust their thermostat, and it's World War III. When you're winning, act like you're winning. Tell jokes. Don't comment on what people have on. Don't call people bird brain. The other thing I would... American people don't like dirty cops. And Joe Biden's gang of lawyers jumped Donald Trump. With six on one, they're kicking them, hitting them with raids, with fines, with mug shots. And Americans don't like that. They want to see a fair fight. That clip cracked me up because I was like, Jesse Waters, do you know the difference between a member of law enforcement and a lawyer? I question if you do, based on what you just said there. Do you also understand that some of the cases that Trump is facing have absolutely nothing to do with Joe Biden. The E. Jean Carroll case is a civil case and has nothing to do with Joe Biden. And then you're dealing with cases in uh, you're dealing with a case in Georgia that has that has to do with Trump, not Biden. And then the case in New York that has to do with Trump. The other civil fraud case has nothing to do with Biden. But sure. And again, what are you talking about? You make no sense. The Republican Party is now more unified than the Democratic Party. And the Democrats are the ones on defense. I command a team Trump ought to be concerned about unifying the Republican Party, because as we see in the uh, uh, in, in these states, a third of the vote in Virginia, 43 uh, percent of the vote in Massachusetts going to Nikki Haley, a quarter of the vote in North Carolina, 
Uh, Maine has now dropped down to about a quarter of the vote, but it was 31 percent for Nikki Haley, Vermont 48 percent. So but- that's Jesse Waters, who again predicted a great red, red wave at the midterms and who also predicted that Michelle Obama would run for president. He hasn't actually given up on that dream, but that's not we'll get to that in the weekly podcast. But um, and that was followed by Karl Rove. So who are we going to believe? A man who got his job because he made racist man on the street? segments working for Bill O'Reilly or Carl Rove, a lifetime political strategist. I'd go with Carl Rove and he had the whiteboard. He had the whiteboard with his little, you know, percentages written out, showing them to the camera. Next is Jessica Tarloff also making a great point. Joe Biden is cruising through this thing tonight. I mean, we're seeing numbers 90 percent, 91, 92, 93 percent. No, I'm old enough to remember when we thought Dean Phillips was a thing, right? Or we're (laughs) tracking how many uncommitted voters you have. The Democratic Party. A little bit of shade there for Dean Phillips. Moving on to hour three, the featured host is Sean Hannity. Pretty much the same setup again. A new panel. This time we have Kaylee McEnany, uh, Charles Payne, Juan Williams, Ari Fleischer, Mark Thiessen, and Katie Pavlich. It was crowded. It was crowded. And they also had special guest Kevin McCarthy. He wasn't on set, but he called in. And we're going to start this hour with an update about what's going on with the alcohol situation at Mar-a-Lago. Um, I, I was able to ask if there is alcohol here, and there is. There is a cash bar, though. There is a cash bar. Um, and I was able to ask the campaign if they're going to maybe pop some champagne later tonight. They said they'd get back to me. Republicans are racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. They want dirty air and water, transphobic, and they want to kill grandma and grandpa. I would argue, and I think I'm right, that in in 22, Republicans were not prepared for how the Democrats would demagogue the issue of abortion. So Hannity repeats that spiel all the time. I have a I have a clip of him doing it like two years apart. He just did it again. Um, And then demagogue abortion. Where have you been since 1973? Where have you been? Abortion has always been contentious. Are you kidding? You were surprised by this? Really? Demagogue. Taking people's rights away. Demagogue. (laughs) Next up, Ari Fleischer bragging about how the Republicans are becoming less educated. I'm a much more a blue collar party, a working class party, a less educated party and a lower income party. But these changes, Brett, started under Ronald Reagan. Reagan, in 88, won 62 percent of the college vote. George H.W. Bush, when he ran and won, he got 51 percent of the college vote. Donald Trump got 43 percent of the college-educated vote. Suburbs. Reagan won 20 percentage points in the suburbs. George W. Bush, when he won, won the suburbs by five. Donald Trump lost them by two. These have been long-standing trends that Trump has accelerated, and we're on the tipping point now. Now, I'm not sure that's something to brag about, and I'm not dissing people who don't have a college education or higher. I get it. It's expensive. Not everybody's college bound. It doesn't mean a person is of lesser intelligence. My father went to trade school. My father would never make it in in college. He uh, has dyslexia. He didn't get training for it because back in that day, nobody did. And he really struggled in school. I'm not diminishing anybody without a higher education. However, I do want to point out that if you look at the uh, history of fascist governments in Europe in 1920 and 1930s, in Italy and in Germany, the one of the demographics that they did very, very well in were the least educated. And this is provable. You can look at like where the districts had the highest votes for fascist parties, and that's where you're going to find them. So to me, that's more of a red flag than it is anything to brag about. Just my two cents. And I, I, I mean no disrespect. I have very good friends who never went to college who are brilliant people. People don't go to college for all kinds of reasons. Now, next up is something that also happened on primary night that Fox made a really big deal about. And you can imagine what that is. Here's Brett Baer. In American Samoa, President Biden will lose to Jason Palmer, a self-described <laughs> entrepreneur and investor <laughs> He is going to win the American Samoa Democratic Caucus. This marks President Biden's first loss in the 2024 primaries. Mm -hmm. Palmer takes four delegates. President Biden takes 
two. We saw uncommitted with more than 100,000 votes in Michigan. I don't even know who Jason Palmer is. <laughs> <laughs> now, this next clip I just, again, found funny, and that's why I included it. It's Brett Baer kind of reminding uh, Kevin McCarthy of a, of a nicer past, of a grander past, I should say. Speaker, this Thursday is the State of the Union. It's the first in a few years that you won't be sitting behind the President of the United States trying to hold your facial expressions one way or another. Um, now, the non-committal vote will be coming up throughout the rest of the evening because, of course, that was a very big deal. And I just want to say, no matter how you feel about the Israel-Hamas war and U.S. policy towards Israel, um, I think that was an absolutely brilliant uh, protest. Again, you don't, I'm not saying I agree with the movement or how I feel about it, but what I love about it is it caused no harm. Uh, you know, you could say it hurt Biden's reputation. I don't think it did, but it caused no actual harm. We're not going to accidentally vote Trump because it was a primary and people who put it together knew that. But I think what's so genius about it is it showed the White House and the Biden campaign exactly where people are dissatisfied and how many there are of them, approximately. It's a primary. Only hardcore voters even vote in a primary. But I think I was, like, blown away. I, I wasn't I was skeptical of it at first, but I was like, this is actually working. Like, now he can see, and the Biden campaign can see, where you have a problem, where you need to reach out, and what you need to do to win those voters back. And so, uh, and again, no property was damaged. Nobody uh, got arrested. And there's no images of, like, a burning Wendy's that... Fox News can play on repeat for years after it happened, going, look at these people, they're great, you know, because that's what Fox does. And again, I understand the Wendy's fire and all that, but it, when Fox gets people in a protest acting outrageous, this is some insight that I've had uh, studying right-wing media. Very dramatic, over-the-top protests get weaponized against the protesters by the right-wing media. And I just wanted to briefly uh, share my experience as somebody who is not right wing, who consumes a great deal of right wing media, of why very performative protests can help and sometimes hurt a movement. Just my two cents, having watched a lot of Fox News and what they do with this footage. So moving on, we go on to hour four. We have basically the same setup, which is rare. It's one of the few times they recycled the same people, but they did. Um, they also included a second panel, so they sort of mixed it up, which includes Charles Payne, Sandra Smith, and uh, yeah, those are the only two new people, but Charles Payne is going to be in these clips, so that's why I needed to mention him. Uh, Martha, we have some breaking news here, something I didn't expect to say on Super Tuesday, standing just a few dozen yards away from where President Biden sits tonight. We have reaction from the Biden campaign about President Biden's defeat in American Samoa by Jason Palmer. His website is down right now, uh, probably crashed a lot of new interest in him. That is, of course, Peter Ducey, the spawn of Steve Ducey. <laughs> Never called him spawn before, but that's funny. Um, and of course, he's just kind of joking on the American Samoa thing. Next clip is Charles Payne. Charles Payne, I'll give you a little bit of context. The clip was way too long to include the whole thing. He's basically saying, Biden panders to poor black people, not rich black people or, or middle class black people black people and that's the problem and he kind of gets into it with Juan Williams here they were both black men they're you know what they're saying you know what you can't get my vote if you promise me higher minimum wage no thank you you can't get my vote if you promise me nicer public housing no thank you you cannot get my vote anymore I want an economic backdrop where if I pull myself up by the bootstraps maybe one day I'll have a private jet and I'll have generational wealth that's well, I think, I think there are people like that, Charles. I just don't think that's what we're talking about. I don't think that represents the black vote in America. When we talk about increases for Trump, you may be talking about some people like that who love his gangster style and his... I'm talking about prosperity. Flash. Prosperity. No, because they, you know, if you're talking... You can't hang on, Charles. Hold on, hold on. Hang on a second, Charles. You can't Charles. promise them higher, Charles. more wealth no, to get their vote. Charles, that's right. nobody's promising that. Instead, I mean, if you're watching the State of the Union later this week, you hear that we didn't have a recession, and there was a lot of talk among the experts that you consult that this was going to be a recession. We did have a recession. We did not have a recession. I looked that up because uh, we did not have a recession um, on Investopedia, and some economists think that we had a recession basically from February 2020 
to basically April 2020 because of the pandemic. That's debatable, but I included a link if you want to check that out. Moving on, this is Harold Ford Jr. with Dana Perino. She, he should, he she, she, you don't think she should call him and say, congratulations, sir, and then they try to move on from there? Yeah, but if, if I'm trying to heal the breach in my party, and there's a breach, we need to be clear, 30% of Republicans still say that they, they, they wanted someone else. I'd reach out. What, what does he lose not reaching out I, to her? Well, I, and I, I don't disagree I, either, but I, I just... Now, of course, they're talking about Nikki Haley and Donald J. Trump. And then Trump gave his victory speech, which was a rambling, disturbing mess full of lies that lasted 19 minutes. And we move on to hour five. Now, new entire setup. We've moved to the West Coast. This is Trace Gallagher in Los Angeles. We have uh, some mix-ups with the correspondents. And the panel is now, this is how funny it is, the panel is now Brett Baer and Martha McCallum. The producers included a second panel, which was Vic Baja, who is a criminal defense attorney, Steve Hilton, who's a political commentator, Lee Carter, who's a pollster, Jason Chaffetz, uh, Roma Davari, and Stephanie Hamill. Stephanie Hamill used to work at OAN. She's not in this clip, but I wanted to include her because I thought it was funny. I included everybody just to show the just how much Fox gets into this. Just ha- They just can't get enough people on screen. So um, here we go. At some point tonight in the war room in Wilmington, Delaware, where the re-election is based, a name crossed people's computer screens there, the campaign staff, that they were not expecting. That name, Jason Palmer, he defeated President Biden in American Samoa. I just want to point out very quickly that I am not repeating a clip. That was a separate... (laughs) So Peter Ducey, and he started the hour. So he started hour uh, four, making that joke about Samoa. And he started hour five, making the same joke about Samoa. It is now 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm sure that the audience for Fox News is starting to shrink, which is why they moved it over to L.A. And um, the next voice you're going to hear, this is Steve Hilton. I found him incredibly grating. He is British. Um, He used to have a show on Fox, doesn't anymore. I think he's like a podcast. I don't really care what he does. I couldn't stand him. He drove me nuts. Why? The only argument you're going to hear from the Democrats and Biden, the same ones they tried before, abortion, Trump's a threat to democracy. On the actual issues, as Vic says, that matter to people, they've got nothing to say. So I I couldn't stand the way he talked because he was very strident and everything was incredibly loud. That's one of the reasons why he got on my nerves. And he comes across as just incredibly arrogant. But the line that... um, It was subtle, but I caught it. He says, you know, they don't care about the issues that actually matter to people after he just said abortion. He said they care about abortion, but they don't care about the issues that actually matter to people. And I went, whoa, buddy, you might want to look up some recent elections where abortion was on the ballot. And I think that would change your mind on that opinion. So my apologies, I forgot to announce this one. Akash Patel, he is the special guest in the fifth hour. He's the former chief of staff to acting secretary of defense under Trump, of course. Now, he has said some absolutely wackadoodle things about January 6th that have been debunked all over the place, including Trump's claim that he sort of ordered 10 to 20,000 Uh, National Guard troops before January 6th because he was anticipating trouble. And they both, Cash Patel and Trump, have tried to blame the lack of security on January 6th on former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, which is a bunch of nonsense. It's been debunked all over the place. Even one of the people they claim was in the meeting with them when this happened has said it didn't happen. So Cash Patel, ladies and gentlemen, Just imagine that credibility there. And this is his infinite wisdom on primary night. I actually took a look at those numbers up against Joe Biden, and I know he's running unopposed, but in places like North Carolina, Michigan, and Minnesota, President Trump scored more numerical votes than Joe Biden. I think that speaks volumes to the shift in America towards Donald Trump. So I'm just going to destroy that uh, Trump had more votes argument, completely obliterate it, turn it to dust. Number one. Trump was in a much more competitive situation because Nikki Haley had millions of dollars and people who were very passionate about her campaign. She's, you know, even though she didn't win anything but Vermont and, uh, you know, District of Columbia, she still was getting 40 percent, 30 percent. Those are decent numbers, you know. So that's more people are going to turn out number in general because they're going to fear Nikki Haley winning. Number two, 
When you're dealing with states like Arkansas and Oklahoma, yeah, Trump's going to have much bigger numbers than Biden because they're some of the reddest states in the country. So that's just a ridiculous thing to even argue. It just didn't even make any sense. And when you've got an incumbent, people just are like, well, yeah, he's got it. So they're not as likely to show up and vote. Duh. Just a completely ridiculous thing he said there. Now Cash Patel moves on to, I don't know how anyone who says this is taken seriously, the deep state. Our Donald Trump has come in and exposed the deep state's flank and their weapon of choice, which is a two-tier weaponized system of justice. It's not a right-wing conspiracy talking point anymore. So I, I hate to burst your bubble there, Cash Patel, but just because uh, stupid right-wing conspiracies get repeated in right-wing media ad nauseum does not make them true. The Great Replacement, the Deep State, the Great Reset, none of this stuff is true. It's all nonsense, and you just keep repeating it. Cultural Marxism, don't get me started on that not complete and utter nonsense. When you deep dive into that one, are you kidding me? You're saying that professors have more influence than, I don't know, technology or the, the just don't even, I can't, I can't. You know what changed our culture? You know what changed our culture? I'm going to go on a rant here. It's called the the Industrial Revolution radically changed humanity forever. We went from the farms to the cities. Our work changed completely. And that's what started all these wheels into motion. People used to live in huge extended families. At, it was something like, like over 90% of, of humans lived in farms. Industrial Revolution hits. Bam. Now we're all separated into little nuclear families. That's become the dominant family type. So this idea that that's the way it's always been is nonsense. No, we lived with our aunts and our uncles and our cousins at least closely, if not in the same, you know, exact community. That's how we used to live. Industrial Revolution changed that. That's what changed the culture. It's not professors. It's anybody who believes cultural Marxism, I wonder if they're okay. Like, have you sat down and actually thought about this? Because I'm going to offer an alternative reality, which is our, the actual reality, which is technology changed our lives forever. It changed warfare. It changed how we live. It changed how we talk to each other. That's what's changed the culture. The fact that I'm a single woman, unmarried, and can live and survive on my own, chef's kiss, thank you, universe, is because of technology and the changes in our culture. I don't really have more time to waste on cultural Marxism, but that's the, it's gone completely mainstream. They mention it, you know, outright on Fox News. Ted Cruz has a book about it. It's total, complete nonsense. It's nonsense. The United States is more capitalist than we've ever been. Uh, not much has changed since this ridiculous movement supposedly started. Um, the culture all over the world has changed because of technology, um, not professors. So, and I mean no disrespect to professors, but the Industrial Revolution radically changed humanity. I think it's difficult to argue that it didn't. So moving on, by the way, the vote in Samoa, which they keep talking about it for the rest of this evening, was Jason Palmer got 51 votes and Joe Biden got 40. It's total. It's 91 people. Trump got a total of 110 votes. Now, American Samoa, I'd say that's a low turnout considering the total population is 45,000 people. So moving on. We're moving on. Then they go on this weird riff about how California is turning red, which is something they're trying to support this um, Senate race in California, which seems kind of hopeless for the Republican candidate. But we'll get to that later. Um, and they just go down this whole series of like, yeah, California is red because I just feel it sort of odd. But I think what, we, what we're seeing, um, and I'm glad that the nation is waking up to this, is that California is way more Republican mm -hmm. than people think. You, you know, you've done a lot of work here. It, it, is, it is blue. I mean, Steve Hilton's his optimistic view, but it is blue, blue in California. Is the pendulum swinging? Now, this last voice you haven't heard yet is Vic Baja, he's a criminal defense attorney. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I've had court in Santa Cruz. I've had court in San Francisco, in Oakland, in Los Angeles, in San Diego, not to mention the federal courts throughout California. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, the conversation I have with everyone on the other side, on the prosecutorial side, and on my side, the defense side, is safety, border yep. and money, the trifecta. It's a very simple equation, and now the pendulum is swinging. It may take a couple of three years, 
but it's undeniable at this point. We move on to hour six, which is midnight Eastern Standard Time. Basically the same crew, same panel. Um, and this is the Steve Garvey hour. Who's Steve Garvey, you may ask? He is a Republican running for Senate in California. He is a former incredibly popular baseball player, but he's in his 70s at this point. He's never run for public office. He has no political experience. And it showed, in my humble opinion. So, but this has become the Steve Garvey hour. They were kind of setting it up with that California is more red than you think. And this is when the return started to come in for Steve Garvey. It seems like a new era. We have Republican Steve Garvey, um, who is a baseball star here. He has gotten so much attention. He has been leading with Adam Schiff. And that is big. The two were leading in this race out of the 27 candidates who were on the ballot. Um so uh, that voice you just heard was Christina Coleman. She's a correspondent in Los Angeles, just working for Fox. She's standing on the street saying that. And yes, they were trying to really build up excitement for Steve Garvey. Um, now, I'll explain very briefly. They talk about it a little bit. Um, but California has, has what they call a jungle primary. In most states, if you're international and you're listening to this podcast, you have a primary. We have two parties. It's the goofy American two-party system. So each party, um, people vote in the primary. They nominate a candidate. And then it's always Republican versus Democrat. Well, California doesn't do it that way. In California, uh, it's relatively easy compared to other states to get on the ballot. And anybody can run for U.S. Senate if you meet certain qualifications. I think you have to get signatures and, and such like that. But you can get on the ballot and then you basically whoever wins the top two slots for the um, election for the primary moves on to the general election. In most cases in California, because of this, because the state is so incredibly blue, especially in a statewide election, it ends up being two Democrats. So at the, you know, in November, uh, people who live in California have the choice of two Democrats. Um, it could be two Republicans. It could be two independents. It could be anybody because California has this kind of open system. It's just that there's a lot of Democrats. They tend to dominate and that's what happens. Now, this time, Adam Schiff was running against um, two formidable other Democrats, and he decided he was going to gamble and throw money into promoting Steve Garvey, thinking he's a weak candidate. And if he wins, because he's got a lot of name recognition, he's this famous baseball player, he's popular, um, I can beat him in the general. And that's exactly what he did. So he spent $11.2 million to boost Garvey. And this upset other people he was running against. Uh, Katie Porter was like his closest challenger. And at the end of the day, Steve Garvey actually won the primary in California, which is nutty. It wasn't at the time of this recording of this broadcast, he had not won. Garvey had not won. It doesn't matter who wins the primary, though, because they're both going to go head to head in November. Now, I didn't know that much about Steve Garvey, and I'm just going to tell you, whew, I think Adam Schiff is going to just, this is going to be a shellacking, which is often used in sports, so I don't mind using that term, but it's going to be a shellacking which is, means it's not even going to be close. So this is Steve Hilton kind of crowing about how Steve Harvey came in. At this point in time, it was number two. Wouldn't it be the most delicious, delicious outcome here if Adam Schiff, with all his genius strategy of pumping up Steve Garvey and getting the candidate he wanted, actually ended up losing as a result of his tactics? So they show Steve Garvey's acceptance speech or victory speech, I guess. He didn't win anything, but he you know, came in second. Again, at this time, he was second. And um, I went, OK, well, this is really obvious why Schiff boosted this man. Now, it comes across as very affable and kind, and I could see why he's popular. I watched the entire speech. This is just a couple excerpts from it. He at no point mentioned a specific policy or any type of legislation that he wants to pass or really gave any idea of anything that he would do for California. It was a bunch of baseball references and cliches and just like, I love you, love me. And it was so pathetic that even his, like, icon for his campaign 
was a silhouette of a baseball player. What does it have to do with being a U.S. senator? Nothing. But here's the clips. What you are all feeling tonight is what it's like to hit a walk-off home run. They say in the general election that we're going to, uh, to strike out. You know what that's from? That's from the crowd that believes in the status quo. Well, Ronald Reagan said that's Latin for the mess we're in. Well, know this. It ain't over till it's over. We got to the starting line, and that quote you all know is true in baseball and true in politics. And my opponent has been advertising that he, he wants me, and he's mistaking kindness for weakness. <laughs> Remember that old saying: "Be careful what you ask for." <laughs> So another indication that Schiff is going to completely pummel uh, Steve Garvey is if you look at how many people. Now, this is one where it does matter, because if you look at California, deeply blue state, and then you just take the two other top Democrats who are running against Schiff or running in the same election, I should say, and put their voters together with Schiff. And it's not even close. It's like he would completely, completely destroy Steve Garvey. There's just so many more Democrats in California, and I, I am not buying that they would be persuaded to vote for this completely, um, uh, you know, un inexperienced non-politician who just says, "We're gonna get a home run, guys." Ronald Reagan said, "I'm like, what? Are you? Wow, wow, he's a lightweight." Next is this is Stephanie Hamill, who's from OAN, and she just makes a funny comment, and that's why I included it. Major networks and the anchors who are cutting away from Donald Trump during his speeches are really hurting themselves. They're hurting their credibility and they're hurting their ratings. The people and the voters have the right to hear from some of the serious candidates, especially Donald Trump. As I covered um, One American News Network when I was in uh, grad school. That was what that was included in my capstone, which is what eventually turned into decoding Fox News. And I always got a kick out of her because she's just always like really angry, Stephanie Hamill. So that is um, funny because the reason why networks are cutting away from his speeches is number one, they're incredibly long. He goes on for like a half hour, half to 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and they're full of lies. And that's why they're cutting away because he's just making stuff up. And people are just fed up with, I think people are trying to learn from the last election of accidentally giving him too much press. I don't know if we have learned that yet, but... Um, I, uh, I don't want to go on a tangent about the press right now, but uh, the, the tendency now is to, instead of just airing Trump when he's just lying through his teeth, is to just not air Trump. I have mixed feelings about it, too, because I also think the more people are reminded of Trump's crazy, the more they'll be motivated to go out and vote against him. So it's, it's a delicate balance. I don't know the right answer. I'm no Svengali. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm holding on for dear life here at Decoding Fox News is what I'm doing. So next up, hour seven. Inexplicably, Fox goes back to the East Coast. So now it is 1 a.m., really 1 a.m., and Mike Emanuel and Jillian Turner become the new anchors for this section. And they both are visibly exhausted. And they're talking about how tired they are throughout the entire broadcast. Um, same, they have new correspondence because again, it's now 1 a.m. and they're on the East Coast. And the panel is, and this is the panel of all panels, but of course they have them on at 1 a.m. because nobody's watching. Leslie Marshall, she's a talk show host, she's a liberal. John Boosie, he's associate editor of the Wall Street Journal, and he says a lot of great things. And then they have a man named Giano Caldwell, he's on Fox, he's a political analyst. Now, this segment opens with Kevin Cork, he's a correspondent in D.C. You could tell he writes his own copy. That's all I have to say about this. You pointed out, but you could say he broke out the Swiffer wet jet and mopping the floor with Ambassador Haley, at least among GOP voters. Schiff and Garvey finishing one and two in the voting in the Golden State. So now we move on to Leslie Marshall did not come to play. Leslie Marshall, she completely changed the tone of the coverage on Fox as soon as she spoke her first words on camera. Marsha is Marshall is a no-nonsense, blunt, fierce Democrat. 
She's 10 Jessica Tarloffs with an alto voice and a take no prisoners attitude. There's a very good reason why they're not going to have her on the five. And I'm not dissing Jessica Tarloff. I'm a huge Jessica Tarloff fan. But this woman in a table with uh, Greg Gutfeld would not end well. Would not end well. If you stay home or if you're uncommitted, I've said before and I'll say it again, uh, and you're a Democrat and you're not going to vote for Joe Biden, then you are voting for Donald Trump with your inaction or your lack of commitment. So Marshall just gets better and better, but I'm going to include some of her clips together in like a row here. Polling for Americans' attitudes toward a rematch between the current president and the former president is like a colonoscopy without anesthesia. And Marshall sort of reminds Fox viewers that Trump is not popular outside of their little bubble. We're a divided country. It's almost 50-50. The president, despite his poll numbers, we've seen in midterms, we have seen, we saw in Ohio, and we're going to see in the general election enthusiasm from my party and from people that don't want Donald Trump and felt that he hi uh, felt and feels that he hijacked the Republican Party um, to, uh, you know, take the party over again. Uh, and, and a lot of people are just like, we don't want to go back. We want to go forward. And now we've got Boosie. And again, these are the two main voices uh, going off about Donald J. Trump. Again, he's from the Wall Street Journal. So now we get down to the issues and we get down also to the fact that we have a candidate running who has been uh, convicted of business fraud, uh, who has been convicted of sexual harassment and of def defamation and has a lot of other court cases uh, that are uh, in the works and could be decided against him in the middle of this campaign. And very quickly, the next voice you're going to hear is Shab Murab. He's one of the co-chairs of the Colorado Democratic Party. The story of this election is starting to become really clear. Joe Biden is overperforming every poll, and Donald Trump is underperforming every single poll. Right here in Colorado, Joe Biden won 85 percent of his voters tonight, and Donald Trump was lucky to crack 60 percent. And so Donald Trump and the RNC have a big problem on their hands. How are they going to unify their party? They're in a huge amount of disarray, and they're going to have to answer for their war on women and their war on farmers and ranchers across this country with their misguided trade wars. They killed a border deal. And those are the issues that Americans are really going to be going to the ballot box for this fall. He had a longer segment th than that, but it was absolutely glorious because he was very good at what he does and that he was getting out the information very quickly. You knew he knew it backward and forwards. He knew all the stats about Colorado. He knew what, Col and the reason why they focused on Colorado was this ballot measure that got, I don't think anybody was surprised that the Supreme Court voted that down because I think we all saw that coming, but Fox kept talking about it throughout the night. The other thing they kept talking about is the non-commit vote, which I also, again, think was a brilliant political move by the people who support it. There are roughly 20% of tonight's turnout so far did not vote for President Biden. Rather, they voted uncommitted as a form of protest, demanding Biden call for a ceasefire in Gaza. I believe that was Mark Finn, who's a uh, correspondent at Fox News. It's a disembodied voice, and they were showing something else on the screen, so I'm not exactly sure who said that. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Matt Finn. They had Kevin Cork, Matt Finn, Connor Hansen, and Rebecca Castor, all East Coast, again, in the middle of the night. So um, we're moving on. This is now 2 a.m., hour 8. It's basically the same group of people, Marshall and Boosie continue to bolster Biden and bash Trump. It's just clip after clip. Well, right now, former President Trump is rolling, and I mean rolling like an offensive lineman sitting in a grocery cart headed downhill in San Francisco. He's got it. Kevin Cork getting creative at 2 a.m. Uh, I included those because I thought they were funny. Say my party is not putting out front and center with immigration, for example, that there was a drop in border crossings from December to January, and that continued in February of more than 50 percent. That's a headline I would want to see if I were on a border state, obviously outlining women rep women's reproductive rights and abortion uh, and the plans with what, what he wants to do and the difference between, you know, him and his, you know, alleged uh, opponent coming up. Like with Gaza, for example, you have people people, especially in Michigan and the Muslim community, who are upset with him in the handling of that. But you're not going to hear from the Trump administration, supply drop, food drop, ceasefire, two-state solution. Now, I was outright cheering at this point. And yes, I was up that late, too, capturing this and just going, what the? I just thought she put that so beautifully in very little time, just bam, 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 bam. 
And that last line of you're not going to hear from the Trump administration, supply drop, food drop, ceasefire, and two-state solution. And I was like, wow. Because Trump basically helped Bibi move the um, capital to Jerusalem. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He cut off funding for the Palestinians. He initiated, he started a ban on Muslims from entering the country. He started a registry of Muslims. He tried to, at least. Um, he also moved the, he declared the Golan Heights for Israel when Syria says they're theirs. And then he also um, installed an ambassador who um, was a bankruptcy attorney who wanted to annex the entire West Bank for Israel. And again, Trump has also said he wants to deport Muslims and he'd love to bring the Muslim ban back. So none of this is good. None of this is good. It's a terrible situation already. It would be 10 times worse. Now we're gonna move on to Boosie who brings up Biden and the economy. A message uh, explain that the inflation that uh, occurred in his administration and that started with the Trump administration was the fault of neither president. Um, that was, it was the fault of the pandemic and that inflation, that uh, prices are higher in part because wages are higher and they get passed through to consumers. He has to somehow begin to take some credit but explain the economy uh, to, to voters. So Boosie was also amazing. And again, the Wall Street Journal is not a lefty liberal uh, publication. It is also owned by the same company that owns Fox News. Now Boosie, again, of the Wall Street Journal, a very conservative uh, newspaper, makes a direct stab at Donald J. Trump. And this is not a mild criticism. But I think you're gonna see him and Democrats begin to also address Trump's big problem, and that is his character issue. Uh, the, the chaos that you referred to uh, uh, under his administration, uh, the lies about the last election results and many other things, the handing over of Ukraine to Putin, the, the lack of support for Ukraine, and the, the language, the authoritarian anti-democratic language that uh, former President Trump sometimes uses violent language, uh, the vermin uh, that are poisoning our blood, you know, uh, referring to his political opponents, but taking a page right out of 1930s Germany. I, I, Again, Wall Street Journal, boom goes the dynamite. He just went there and I agree with him. And I'm like, yes, 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 say this. This is Fox News. This was happening on Fox News which was also why I was jumping out of my skin because this is two o'clock in the morning. Nobody's watching it except for me and a bunch of other weirdos. And I'm going, this is actually, somebody actually said that on Fox News and nobody shut them off or cut their mic? That both of those people just spoke? Are you kidding me? Last hour, n on, uh, hour nine, here we go. We have some new people. Lauren Wright will be speaking later. She is an associate research scholar of politics at Princeton University and Giano Caldwell, who's been there the whole time, finally gets a line in. Yeah, VP, I think she'll still be on the table for Nikki Haley. I mean, what better way to appeal to Nikki Haley's voters than to bring her on as your running mate? It's true. If exactly you want to unify right. the party, she got she did get serious votes. She didn't win, but she's you know the runner up. So there you go. Again, that was Giano Caldwell talking to the two hosts, Mike Emanuel and Gillian Turner did not seem very enthusiastic about the prospect of Nikki Haley becoming VP. I think most people don't think that's going to happen considering her contentious relationship with Trump. Uh, this next clip is Lauren Wright, who's the scholar from Princeton. And in fact, he's not. Most former presidents would run on their experience and their record, but he's still running on some of these personal grievances. He's still running uh, really a lot more like show business than we think about politics in the U.S., at least in recent history. So, yes, there you go. And if you're wondering if anybody uh, during this incredibly late time time slot was incredibly pro-Trump and pushing Trump and he's amazing and we're going to win it, they were not which was what was so remarkable about this. Now, again, I don't know who the heck was watching at 3 a.m. because this is literally 3 to 4 a.m. this hour. Um, Caldwell, Gianno Caldwell, was getting some pro-Trump stuff out because he's like a true believer. He works up for Fox. He was pretty much it because the, the co-anchors, Emmanuel and Turner, were being pretty neutral and professional. They were very tired. They kept talking about it, and you could tell they were very, very tired. 
Uh, this next clip is Boosie again, talking about the obstacles that Trump is going to face. Our polling shows that that moderate Republicans and independents are watching these cases and might decide, they say, to vote against Trump uh, if another conviction comes down the road. He's been convicted of business fraud, financial fraud, sex abuse, defamation in three cases with juries in some of those cases. Um, he has decided, yes, that has galvanized his base who say, well, these are political, you know, decisions. They're not. They're by juries and by courts. And Trump has attacked the judges, attacked the courts, and in so doing, once again, attacked the rule of law in the United States. That doesn't sit well with independents and moderate Republicans. Republicans. He's got to watch out for that. And I include this next clip because I haven't heard anyone in the press and I do watch a lot of Fox and besides Fox, I watch PBS. I really don't have time to watch anything else. I'll be honest, but I haven't heard this point made yet about Nikki Haley. And I just thought it was interesting and I wanted to include it. This is Lauren Wright, the um, scholar from Princeton again. That voters age 65 plus, 75 plus, you're not gonna find a group in the electorate that turns out more reliably. And so when Nikki Haley started up with the strategy of the two old men and they're just as bad and they're sort of out to lunch and we need a new generation, you might be alienating the voters you need most, especially as a Republican, because they're a big part of the GOP base. And finally, we end it with Marshall again, the wonderful, amazing radio talk show host. I want to be her when I grow up, even though I don't want to be a pundit. I really don't want to be a pundit, but she's obviously a pundit. But um, here she is. She's just amazing. And when you have the fear of, you know, some of the legislation that we're seeing, you know, whether it's, you know, with regard to IVF or to traveling or to birth control or the morning after pill and, and the list goes on in states and then talk of, you know, a federal ban, um, you know, that can be very effective to motivate voters to come out and to vote Democrat, to vote for Joe Biden. So because this is a Decoding Fox News podcast and newsletter, I came up with a chart where I did a word search for all nine transcripts uh, combined. Of course, Trump was used 525 times, Biden 385, Haley 185, Border 150, Economy, 81, Steve Garvey, 39, Uncommitted, 31, Crime, 28, Samoa, 24, <laughs> that was funny, Migrant, 18, Jason Palmer, 6, Michelle Obama, 4, Lake and Riley, 3, and Deep State, 3. So that's it. That's the pie. I did it in under an hour. I did it in under an hour. It's technically under an hour, 58 minutes, technically. So if you would like, <laughs> if you want to find more on Fox News, you can find me at Twitter, uh, also known as X Threads, Instagram, TikTok, on Facebook, I'm Juliet Jeske. And if you want to become a supporter of Decoding Fox News, you go to my Substack for Decoding Fox News, Patreon, Decoding Fox News, and share the podcast, share the newsletter. Odin and Thor, the podcast mascots, send their love. I will see you at the next podcast, which will probably be Tuesday. Kill me now. I'm put a fork in me. I'm done. Thank you so much. Resolute Square.